Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So this is a follow-up video to my last one about Daniel Hapikachu's article. And some things transpired in the past day that I want to touch upon. So if you don't really know the background behind everything that's going on, I don't want you to get the wrong idea or take things out of context. So maybe you want to check that video out first. But anyways, basically what happened was yesterday, Dr. Yasser Qaladi posted a video where he was sharing his beliefs and his view about the LGBT community and how it relates to Muslims, how we should respond um, to this community, should we be involved with them politically, so on and so forth. And subhanAllah, it was so interesting how it happened because apparently he recorded this video last week. So it was before... Daniel Hakikachu published his article before Imam Omar Suleiman um, put out his article, before all of the back and forth on social media, Facebook, Twitter. So we really got to see his true perspective and beliefs regarding this topic. And I thought that that was very beneficial and that was very good. And if you watch that video by Yasser Qadi and I condensed it, to about five minutes that I'll put at the end of this video where I just took out the most relevant parts, but it's a 30 minute video. Inshallah, if you check the description, I'll have links to everything. But he essentially, foundationally, fundamentally, completely agreed with Daniel Hakikachu. He agreed that these things are haram. He agreed that we should vocally condemn and disagree with these things. We should make sure that they don't infiltrate our community. He even said that he understands why Muslims would be politically opposed to them. And he expressed that it is extremely problematic for Muslims to align themselves politically with the LGBT movement. For many different reasons, but one of them being that even if somebody does have the right intention, even if perhaps they have a point that they might find legitimate. The thing is, there's so much nuance when you align yourself with that group publicly that the masses are not really going to understand or perceive the nuance. So it can cause a lot more harm than good. The messages you put out can be very detrimental to the community. So essentially he agreed 100% with Daniel Hakikachu's stance. So I guess that would lead one to ask, well, why didn't he side with Daniel? Well, first of all, let's just make one thing clear. I don't believe Dr. Yasser Qadi was involved at all in this issue. I don't think Daniel mentioned him in the article. I don't think anyone ever brought him up until he involved himself by posting something on Facebook. And given the fact that just last week, he basically expressed that he shares the same beliefs, he has the same perspective as Daniel, it seems that the only thing he really disagrees with is Daniel's approach. He seems to disagree with the idea of publicly mentioning people by name, pointing out specific things that they have done, but everything else he seemed to agree with. So you would think that perhaps his Facebook post, it would have been something like, I fundamentally agree with Daniel's points, when it comes to LGBT, these are things that are haram. We need to keep them out of the Muslim community. We need to speak out against them. It is very problematic to align with them politically. It can give off the wrong idea and the wrong message to all of the younger Muslims and the Muslims at large who don't really understand the nuance that comes with these sort of issues. However, I don't think that Daniel should be calling people out by name I think Omar Suleiman, he's done a lot more good than harm and he should be respected and people shouldn't have put this information out about him. And that seems to be the main argument. And at the end of the day, this is ijtihadi. When it comes to enjoining good and forbidding evil, there's ijtihad to be made about the approach. Sometimes, yes, it's more beneficial to not name people by name, to be very gentle, and sometimes the opposite is true. Sometimes you need to name people by name. Sometimes you need to have some harshness, some firmness. So at the end of the day, it's ijtihadi. But if we look at the 
Facebook post that Yasser Qadi made before posting his video. He said things like, it's sad to see the toxic neo medicalism that is rearing its ugly head online for the last few years. Neophytes who lack proper Islamic training and experience read in the worst into others who have more knowledge, age, and experience than them. They take perhaps a small ijtihadi issue at best, or maybe a slip or mistake of a scholar or da'i at worst, and ignore far bigger problems besetting the ummah. Anyone who dares disagree with them is written off. It used to be via PDF, these days it's via a Facebook status. In all of this, firstly, these people themselves always go down in history as having accomplished nothing. You don't build yourself by destroying others. He makes the comparison to the Khawarij, the Kharajites. Those who bark the loudest accomplish the least in the long run. Their followers typically fizzle out or grow up, while a very, very small handful cling to their narrow worldview and become increasingly irrelevant and outright laughing stocks for the rest of mankind. My advice, let them bark. Now, admittedly, he doesn't mention Daniel Hakikachu or myself or anyone by name, but in the end he says, just FYI, this status wasn't really about my critics, they don't bother me, but I would like to give a shout out to my dear friend, Sheikh Omar Suleiman. And he shares Omar Suleiman's article, which was essentially a response to Daniel Hakikachu. He says, and yes, for the record, I do sometimes disagree with his opinions and positions, and when I do, I advise him directly. He goes on to say, nor even am I that arrogant to never presume that maybe, just maybe, he might be right and I might be wrong on some of those issues where we disagree. We have no Islamic excuse to treat another Muslim, much less a person of knowledge and a community leader and an icon of our faith in this country with bad manners, or subject him to crude, online, public character assassinations and witch hunts. All right, so at the end of the day, if this is just basically an ijtihadi difference of opinion, I don't, I don't get all the name calling, the neo medicalism, the neophytes, the comparison to the Khawarij, you know, saying these people they become laughing stocks, they accomplish nothing, let them bark, all because you just think that what he shouldn't have mentioned Omar Suleiman by name. You fundamentally agree with everything that he's saying, <laughs> and I'm, I mean, all due respect, you yourself are doing the same things that you are accusing others of doing. This is an ijtihadi issue that you are blowing up. Someone disagrees with you and you are writing them off in a Facebook post. Perhaps you can presume that maybe Daniel's correct. Maybe. And as for a character assassinating a person of knowledge, it seems like you recently did that about Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. So I don't really understand why if you're going to involve yourself in this situation and you agree fundamentally with everything Daniel was saying when it comes to LGBT, why there was such a harsh status update on Facebook with all this name calling and denunciation. And this was the main reason that I put out a video and I involved myself was because I saw how people were responding to Daniel. People were calling him names, saying that he's a disgruntled ex-employee. It seemed like there were many people who work for Yaqeen, many friends of Omar Suleiman, who instead of really responding to the issues that Daniel brought up, which I thought were valid and important to address, there was a lot of uh, name calling and anger. I mean, people that I've known for 10 years that are involved with Yaqeen were ready to just burn the bridge with me, some of the stuff that they said. And I let them cool down and they later apologized, but I mean, people just got so emotional and angry instead of really addressing the points. So anyways, then yesterday, uh, Yasser Qadi, he posted this video and I'm about to play the clip at the end so you can see exactly what he mentioned. Overall, I agree with what he said. I think that he agrees with Daniel. If anything, there is an ijtihadi issue of how do you approach this issue? Should you call people out by name? Should you be very gentle? Should you have some harshness? But at the end of the day, I think we all agree fundamentally about these things. And in closing, I just want to say, Daniel has been advising these people privately for years. He's been gentle in the past. He's been talking about the same thing for years now. But it reaches a point where you see people not taking your advice. You see the situation getting worse. And when it comes to enjoining good and forbidding evil, 
there are different approaches. And it appears to me that Daniel's approach was, I'm going to put this out there, I'm going to give Omar Suleiman the clear opportunity to denounce people that he has associated with, promoted and praised in the past, people like Ilhan Omar, people like Linda Sarsour. He wanted them to clarify this idea that we should work alongside the LGBT community for certain political objectives. He's asking specifically which ones. So if after years of private nasiha, nothing happens, the situation seems to be getting worse, people can make that ijtihadi decision to come out publicly for the greater good. That perhaps certain things can be made clear. And worst case scenario, if people are unable to do that, unwilling to do that, sometimes the Muslim community, we have to take it into our own hands. And we have to say, look, we are not going to support and promote people who are doing things and promoting things that are against our best interests, that are against the Quran and Sunnah. Sometimes it reaches that point. So if we can all agree on all these different things, then I don't understand all of the emotions and the anger and the name calling. It seems like we should be able to have these discussions. Anyways, Allah knows best. Please check uh, the following clip from Dr. Yasser Qadi's lecture on LGBT. Jazakumullahu khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, where do we draw the line? For me, the line is very clear. When the person attempts to justify or preach to others. This is where we say, now, brother, you are not keeping it private between you and Allah. Now, if you come and you want to tell our community to do this, just like if somebody wanted to sell alcohol on our premises, no, I'm sorry. It's legal outside over there, the parking lot, go to the other side of the street, do whatever you want, I can't do anything. But this is our zone. This is our rituals, our akhlaq, our morality. So that's within the community. Acting upon it as a sin, justifying it might technically be kufr. To say, I don't care what Allah says, to say it is halal in Islam, you are actually, a'udhu billah, bordering on kufr to, to challenge Allah and His Messenger. That's where we draw the line. If they want us to join their rally for their civil rights, this is a deeper topic, and my position has been very clear from the beginning since the Supreme Court allowed this. Muslims, we don't have to get involved in every political issue of this land. And I personally am against endorsing LGBT rights unconditionally. Sometimes it's better to be quiet. We don't necessarily have to speak against them politically, but we must morally preach the truth. If we don't preach the moral truth, then we have failed in the religion of Allah's obligation on us. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى nas. If we do not say that we believe sexuality is something that is a blessing between marriage and, a and not a blessing outside of marriage. We have to preach this to the people. We can tone the words down, we can preach in a wise manner, but preach we must. Because our goal in this life is to preach the religion of Allah. Whether they agree or disagree. We cannot change this truth. That intimacy and sexuality is something that is a blessing when it is done properly and it is potentially a curse when it is not done properly. And you don't have to only mention this, you can also mention others, LGBT, I extra matter, others, anything in this should not be done. The point being, the issue of politics in LGBT does become complicated in a more technical sense. So much can be said. There is a spectrum of permissible opinion from a theological perspective. Those who want to rally against it, I see where they're coming from and I understand it. Those that are technically saying, I will support the political right, but not the moral right. This is problematic insofar as it's very nuanced and very few people will understand. And you're sending a mixed message to your own kids. Do you really think your children will understand? I don't support you morally, but I support you politically. But still, those who do so, I can't say that they are sinful in the eyes of Allah. They might be unwise, they might be doing something foolish in the long run, but morally speaking, they haven't crossed the red line in my eyes. This is my opinion, my ijtihad. That those who say the American government has no business dictating morality 
And therefore, I will say, the American government should have nothing to do with who gets married and what not. I personally believe this is a dangerous position because you send a double message to our community. That community thinks you're endorsing them. That community feels you're coming on board with them. But then you speak to some, they say, no, no, I'm not. I'm actually just, you know, politically. And then our children as well. And the example I've given is the 21st Amendment, which uh, prohibited, which uh, repealed the 19th Amendment. Alcohol, right? Imagine a hundred years ago that there was a debate going on, should alcohol be legal or not? Because that's what happened a hundred years ago. Literally, a hundred years ago, there was a debate in America. Should we make alcohol legal or not? Because it was banned. You all know this, right? It was banned for three years. It was completely illegal to purchase alcohol. You could go to jail. The, the prohibition era. Now, a movement began. There were protests in the streets. There was marching in Washington, D.C. to make alcohol legal. Do you think Muslims should have participated in those protests? At the forefront, yes, make alcohol legal. The government has no right telling us when we should drink. Do you think it would make any sense? Yet, for some reason, some Muslims think they should do that for the LGBT community. My position is that's not wise or safe, but I still am trying to be technical and say I don't think they've crossed the theological red line as long as they say Islam does not allow this. They're being somewhat hypocritical, but khayr, let that be. My personal position is you don't have to participate. That's what I've done. Neither for nor against politically. Let them do what they're doing, and morally we are preaching what we are preaching, and Allah is our witness.